wonderful introduction, and um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I'm really honored, and I've learned a lot already. Um, I sort of think of my field as kind of tangential to the main topic of this conference. Um, so I've learned a lot, and hopefully I'll be able to share something new with you guys, too. Um, so I am a research faculty at BrainGate. I've been there for a little bit over three years. Um, and a lot of the work I'll be telling you about was done by um, a very large interdisciplinary um, multi-institutional group led by um, Dr. John Donahue and Lee Hochberg at Brown. We also have collaborators at Stanford University, Jamie, Jamie Henderson and Krishna Shinoy, and with the engineering department at Brown, led by Arto Nermiko. And these are all the various people that are in the group right now and all of our various funding institutions that we're very grateful to. So why do we want to create a neural interface? There are a lot of neurological injuries and disorders, such as ALS, stroke, spinal cord injury, and so forth, that um, disrupt the ability to move or communicate, but that leave cognition intact. And there are millions of people that are affected by these disorders worldwide. And assistive technology um, is often very limited. Traditional assistive technology relies on residual motor function that, to some degree, rehabilitation will help with. But um, to the extent that um, the person gets stuck or if the person is completely locked in or has ALS where the disease just gets worse and worse, um, we can't really use just a physical um, input to the assistive device. Um, so what we're hoping to do instead is to tap into the information that's um, still available in the person's brain, which um, potentially is limitless. We have. Um, it's limited only by our ability to record the neural activity and translate it into a useful control signal. So potentially, um, and provide a new output for the person. So potentially, the assistive technology limitation would be a lot, um, sorry, <laughs> it would be a lot less limited if we could use neural activity for the input source. So um, the setup at BrainGate right now is we have our neurosurgeons implant um, this black rock array, which is a 10 by 10 array of silicon electrodes into the um, hand area of primary motor cortex, which is, um, as you know, the, the last cortical area that projects down into the spinal cord and sends motor intentions to the rest of the body. Um, and the dura is replaced. It's a very small array. That here it is relative to the size of the, a dime. It's about four by four millimeters. Um, then the dura is replaced, the bone flap is replaced, the skin is replaced, and then there's a transcutaneous connector, um, a little bit removed from the implant site, that takes the neural signals that are recorded from that area and transmit it to um, this rack of computers via a cable. Um, and the computers take that neural input, decode it, and turn it into the movement of a cursor on a computer screen, for example, or um, a robotic arm. We've had um, eight participants so far in the clinical trials um, over the last 10 years or so. Um, and this is our first participant, Matt Nagel, um, demonstrating how this, this setup sort of looks. Um, and here he is operating, this is a very early example of um, some of the sorts of things that one can use this input signal for. Um, Pardon the cheesy um, sound effects that you're about to hear. Okay, so here's the cybernetics desktop. What do you want to do first? I'm going to open my email first. Okay. I'm going to open the first one. You can open the first one. And it says, Congratulations, you are doing a great job. Very good. Open the second email. Okay. So it says hi, and we'll talk soon. Great. Now, can you exit back to the cybernetics I'm desktop? Going to exit. You can exit. Excellent. So, what's next? Next, I'd like to draw a circle. You're going to draw a circle? Wow. So, I'm going over to paint. Eraser button. Let me try that again. Okay. I it. All right, let's try it again. It'll go. 
Oops. You avoided the eraser that time. That's a bad start. I can do one more next. Okay. To draw a circle. All right. Excellent. Now let's try uh, going back to the desktop. Very good. Okay, so that was a very, very, very early demo, and none of this was actually real. But um, we've come a long way since then, and that's just an example of the sorts of things that you can do with a brain-computer interface. Basically, anything that you can do on a computer. Um, and I like to show this movie to demonstrate um, sort of how natural and intuitive it is for um, participants that are implanted with an electrode array in primary motor cortex to use just um, imagination of their own movements to control the device. Um, all we have to do is figure out how the neural activity maps to their actual movement intentions and then just read out that neural activity as it natively happens when they're just imagining moving their own arm. Um, so basically we see a grid of squares they are all blue. There are 16 of them on screen. And you'll see a hand which is controlled by your thought. And basically the goal is to move the hand to acquire the orange square instead of the turn orange. So before Abe's even really done explaining the directions, he's already gotten a lot of the targets. Contrast is terrible, um, but there is a person sitting right here. Good job. So, the first try, the practice round, you got eight out of ten successes, which actually, even for all men, is very, very impressive. All right, so you might be wondering how do we decode movement intention from neural activity? So, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, we know from decades of animal research that neurons in primary cord um, motor cortex have. Um, so-called preferred directions. So um, early studies from the Georgiopoulos lab in monkeys showed that when a monkey is moving a joystick from the center of this, um, this workspace to targets that light up one by one, if you record the activity of a single neuron, and um, these are rasters of neural activity, you'll find that the neuron, or at least some neurons, have a tendency to increase their firing rate for some directions and decrease their firing rate for other directions. So um, each of these rows is basically um, one trial, one movement in that direction, and each of the little hash marks is a spike coming from a neuron recorded from motor cortex while the monkey is doing this task. So you can see, um, and at zero here is when the movement began. So you can see in these directions, the firing rate of the neuron increases right around movement onset, but in these, de these directions it decreases. <coughs> and if you plot the firing rate of the neuron against um, the movement direction, you'll see what roughly looks like a cosine tuning curve, um, which, if you care, this is what <laughs> the um, model looks like that we fit to these neurons. So um, this is the baseline firing rate, and then the movement, um, sorry, the movement velocity, and then the preferred direction of the neuron um, are related by the cosine of the angle between um, those two velocity vectors, which can also be written out as a dot product, which makes the math really easy to, um, to fit the neural, neural tuning model. This is just the same equation, but in matrix form. If we know the velocities um, of, the, of the arm or of the intended movement, and we know the firing rates of the cells, we can use just a simple linear regression to figure out the, the coefficients that relate the two, the mapping between neural activity and movement intention. Um, unlike in monkey labs, we don't have the luxury of asking the person to move their arms because they're paralyzed. Um, but we do have the luxury of asking them to imagine that they're moving their arm to control, for example, a mouse that moves this cursor to these targets as they light up one by one. And as they're doing this, we record their neural activity from this array of electrodes, and we can map this, um, we can figure out this H matrix just using a regression to figure out how that mapping works. And then the next phase is to go into closed loop neural control where we take that H matrix and, in our case, we um, use it in a Kalman filter to decode the movement intentions from the person's neural activity in real time as the neural activity is collected. And then that is being sent directly to this cursor to move it on the, on the screen. 
This is, um, these are the same equations that are used for, for example, autopilot and flying planes, where you have multiple input sources of, um, with different amounts of noise, and you have to figure out the state of the system based on these various um, measurement modalities that have different variances. But you can also do much simpler linear methods, population vectors, and optimal linear estimators, which are basically just linear models that invert that equation that you saw before, that cosine equation. Um, and this is an example of neural control from participant S3, also now known, known as Kathy Hutchinson. Um, about five years after she was implanted, um, she was in our trial for the longest of any other participant. And um, towards the end, the neural signals weren't quite as great as they were at the beginning. So her control maybe isn't as good as it would have been had we done this task earlier. But um, you can see she still has pretty reasonable control. She had um, a brainstem stroke um, 14 years previous to um, her surgery. So um, can you see the pink neuron here at all? OK, well, you'll be able to hear it, hopefully. Um, this is one of our superstar cells that we recorded from S3 that um, is really well tuned for um, her imagining opening and closing her hand. So in addition to cells with preferred directions in motor cortex, there are also cells that care about grasp state, opening and closing your hand or moving individual digits. Um, and so pay attention to the popping sound and the instructions that the technician gives to S3 um, to imagine that she's opening and closing her hand, even though she can't actually do so. Opening your hand. Relax. Close your hand. Relax. Open your hand. Can you guys hear that difference? So if we have enough cells like that, we can combine um, the um, the directional decoding that we do using the preferred direction model with um, the opening and closing of the hand to, for example, control a robotic arm um, instead of a computer cursor. And that's exactly what we did here. And this paper came out um, last summer. So that's participant S3 again, and she is controlling the robotic arm just in 2D now over the tabletop surface to try to pick up that thermos and bring it to her mouth. It contains cinnamon coffee, which is her very favorite, favorite beverage. So, um, so she's highly motivated. Um, this is an alternate view down here, sort of more from her perspective. And in order to um, initiate the closing of the hand, she just imagines um, grasping. And then she's, she has to bring it to her mouth, and then when it's close enough to her head, another grasp command will cause it to freeze and tilt towards her, and then it will just stay there until she initiates another grasp command. And that gives her enough time to, um, to actually generate enough force to drink from the straw. Drinking through a straw is her normal method of drinking, but it does require a lot of effort for her to actually generate enough suction to, um, to get the drink. You can sort of see it coming up through the straw now. If she gets distracted, like this is true, and thought, will the coffee fall on her? Um, if, no, if, at this point, if she clicks again, or it grasps again, it will just um, allow her to move it in 2D again until she initiates another click. So we're kind of um, using the click as, as an alternate state signal here too. Um, so it's sort of um, combined robot and brain control in a sense. So now she has to move it back onto the tabletop. And this is the first time she's given herself a drink for 14 years. It was a special moment for all of us. There was not a dry eye in the room. <laughs> um, okay, 
So then she does it again a few more times. Um, and here, this is also very hard to see. Um, here we're, um, this is participant T2 now, um, and he is using the DECA arm, which some of you know very well, to, um, to move in three dimensions and just grasp these um, foam ball targets as they pop up one by one. The alternate view is shown up here. It's very, very hard to see. Sorry about that. So this was also part of that same paper, and um, since then, this has, as a lot of you know, been replicated by the Pittsburgh group and extended to even more dimensions. They they also included wrist control. Here we're just doing 3D endpoint control plus open and close. They also added three dimensions of wrist. And um, we're very excited how quickly progress is being made along this front. From what I understand, there are plans to do something similar here <laughs> in collaboration with Caltech. So. The, um, the other thing we can do with this directional and grasp signal is um, a point and click controller over a computer. Um, so we decode the continuous trajectories and then the grasp state can just turn into a click. So the person can do anything on a computer that you and I could do um, with this neural interface. And here's an example of um, S3 again, using um, the neural interface in this QWERTY keyboard um, interface to GChat with my former colleague, Sergei Stavisky, who's now at Caltech, too. Or, sorry, not at Caltech, at Stanford. <laughs> Getting all these institutes of higher learning confused. So, um, so she opened the GChat window and typed hi, and then um, Sergei typed back, hello, how are you? And she's at her home right now, and Sergei is, um, or not right now, but I mean during this movie, and Sergei is at um, Brown. And so in order to select letters, she has to move the cursor over the letter and then um, initiate this grasp command in order to click on it. Um, and up here, there are these small word prediction options that, um, that she can click on to type the whole entire word. So she, she wrote back fine, and then Sergey asked, glad to hear that, what's it like using the BrainGate 2 desktop interface? Um, as you can see, this is sort of slow and painstaking, and one of the reasons for that is that the QWERTY um, layout was actually designed to minimize um, jamming in early typewriters. So it forces people to have to switch hands more often than expected by chance, which translates when you have a single um, access mode, like a, a computer um, cursor, which means they have to move back and forth across the keyboard much more than they would have to by chance. So it's not really an optimal design for a brain-computer interface to make the person use a query layout for a keyboard. Um, I'll let you watch her finish typing her word. So she typed exciting, and now she has to hit enter. So, um, so for that reason, there's um, effort in our lab to design a better keyboard interface for people that are only using a single cursor to type. Um, this is Dan Basher's lab, or Dan Basher's work in the lab. Um, so here she only has to select the wedge containing the letter that she wants to type. Um, and then the cursor automatically flies back to the center and then she only has to move a tiny distance to select the next wedge every single time. Um, and the better her, her control is, the less she has to move in order to get um, confidently within that wedge and then um, click to select. And then it uses something like T9 word prediction, which was used on early cell phones, to, um, to predict possible words that could start with those letter combinations. And if she sees her word, she just selects this green arrow, and then that populates the wedges with those possible words. So here she's typing the quick fox, um, just as a demo. So 
up, and it's a lot faster and easier, and um, a lot of our participants like that better. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, the um, the transcutaneous connector is obviously suboptimal, and this, this cable projecting from the person's head to the um, rack of computers um, actually increases noise because it acts like an antenna, so it makes things worse in a number of ways. Um, the rack of computers itself is very unwieldy. It's not going to be possible for someone wanting to use this um, to wheel it around with them in their wheelchair if they have to lug along this giant cart of computers. Um, and both of these things are actually, um, we're collaborating with Arto and Armico's lab um, at Brown in the engineering department to try to um, miniaturize the whole system onto something the size of an iPhone, which we're calling the brain phone as our pet project. And um, also to make the um, neural, uh, the recording device wireless. Um, we also need to take the technician out of the loop, which is you know, as much as we love our technicians. Um, if a person needs to be there that's trained to use this system in order for the person to use brain control, then we're not increasing the independence of people with motor disabilities. We need to take the technician out of the loop. And that's um, what I've been focusing my research on. Um, depending on how much time I have left, I will, does anybody know where we are? <laughs> okay, um, so I was going to end it there, <laughs> but I also have a bunch of slides just talking about my own role in this project, if you guys are interested in hearing that. Um, so, I'm working towards automating the neural interface system, starting with um, what we're calling closed-loop decoder calibration. Um, so, remember that movie I was showing where the cursor moved to the targets and the person just imagined that they were moving the cursor? We call this open-loop calibration because um, the person doesn't get any feedback of their neural activity at this stage. They just imagine moving their own arm, the cursor does whatever it wants to do. The cursor does what it was pre-programmed to do, no matter what they're doing. They don't even need to be paying attention. Um, and another problem is that neural tuning is known to be context sensitive. So for example, this is um, from an earlier paper in our lab. This unit had a preferred direction to the left during the open loop calibration session, but then it had a preferred direction to the right during neural control. And this neuron also changed its tuning between the two situations. So if this happens a lot, then a decoder that you build during open loop is not going to work well in closed loop neural control. Um, another problem with open loop calibration is that neural signals are not stationary. So the electrode array can move relative to the brain because the brain is soft and it's always pulsing and there might be accelerations in the head. Um, and all of these slight movements can, um, can cause the spike signals that we record to drastically well, appear to drastically change their amplitudes, which can make them look like they're changing their firing rates, their baseline firing rates. So if they change their baseline rate, the cursor will start drifting in the direction in which that neuron increased its rate or um, the opposite direction of neurons that decreased their firing rate. Um, and having to pause neural control in order to recalibrate the cursor using open loop would be really time consuming, it would be inconvenient, and it would probably get annoying. So one possible solution to that is taking the data that we acquired during closed-loop neural control and recalibrating the decoder with that. And this is actually very similar to methods that are um, being used right now in, the, in both the Schwartz and Chinoy labs, where um, we use this closed-loop data to recalibrate the, the decoder. Um, we do exactly the same thing that we did in open-loop. We take the neural, the firing rates that we collect during closed-loop control and we assume at each moment in time that the person's intending to move the cursor directly towards the target, no matter where it actually is. And we use only the initial ballistic, sort of ballistic portion of each trial before there's a lot of error correction to contaminate the neural signal um, to give us sort of the cleanest possible signals. And we found, um, this, this is actually, I forgot to put, um, submitted to Journal of Neuroscience, or Journal of Neural Engineering. Um, we found that using a closed-loop decoder, even when everything is balanced with the initial open-loop decoder, um, improves the neural control. So each of these um, blocks is about two or three minutes of neural control. This is the percent of targets acquired. The black dots represent um, blocks that used just the first open-loop decoder. 
the red dots represent blocks that used um, a closed loop decoder that had the same total amount of data as the original open loop decoder and the same total amount of elapsed time since the calibration of that decoder. As you can see, the performance improved every time we bounced back and forth between the open loop and closed loop decoder. And the blue dots represent a cumulative closed loop decoder, which is sort of the ideal situation where we use as much closed loop data as we've collected up to that point to recalibrate the decoder. So that improves control even a little bit more. And this improvement in performance is generally true across two different participants in seven different sessions. But what happens when targets are not predefined? They're not going to be in most conceivable practical applications of the neural interface, because if you know the person's target in advance, then you don't need to do any decoding. You can just send the cursor to the goal. So um, when the person gets to choose their own targets, is there a way to extend this closed loop decoder calibration to those situations? Um, we came up with this method that's, um, that basically assumes that um, if the person types a word, for example, and doesn't make any corrective actions to undo any of their selections, that they made those selections on purpose. So, um, for example, if, if she types the word hope and goes from the H to the O, um, no matter what, how convoluted that trajectory was, we can assume that she was aiming directly towards the O at each, of the, each moment in time along that trajectory. And then we can do exactly the same thing that we did before, take those, um, sorry, take the neural data that's collected during those time periods and um, do a regression against the target direction and update the decoder that way. Um, those are just details. So we found in some preliminary data that um, typing performance using this, what I'm calling an unsupervised decoder, is similar to performance using the supervised decoder, the one that was calibrated during the closed loop task um, the setter out task where the targets were predefined. Um, and this is the um, performance as measured by correct characters per minute. When the person was using the um, original decoder, their performance was around there using the radio keyboard and the QWERTY keyboard. Um, and when we um, recalibrated the, the decoder here, we found that the performance actually improved a little bit. And across five different sessions from two different participants, we found that in general, the um, typing performance is just about as good using this unsupervised decoder as using a supervised decoder. So to summarize, um, intracortical brain-computer interfaces have the potential to provide a powerful control signal for assistive devices. Um, and closed loop calibration creates a better decoder than open loop, deca than open -loop calibration, um, even without the added advantage of being able to update the decoder iteratively forever without ever having to disrupt neural control. And this could be partially due to context sensitivity of neural tuning. Um, could also be due to the mental engagement. When the person's actually moving the cursor, they're probably much more engaged than when they're just watching it move, and it doesn't matter what they're doing. Um, and then finally, and most importantly, um, unsupervised closed loop calibration has the potential to keep the decoder calibrated indefinitely without ever having to disrupt ongoing practical use of any neurally controlled point-and-click application. And this will be an important step towards um, the automation of the brain-computer interface and eventual clinical utility. And that's all I had. No.